I'm Aisha Zarakol. I'm a reader in international relations at the University of Cambridge. Um, for those in the American system, reader is a <laughs> is a rank that exists only in some parts of the UK, and it's uh, somewhere between associate and full professor. Um, and how did I come to be what I am? I mean. <laughs> um, I studied uh, political science and classics in uh, undergrad uh, in the US. I'm originally from Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, and then I worked as a paralegal <laughs> a year after college, and I didn't like that. At that time, I thought I would go to law school. And not, not knowing what I wanted to do, I just applied to grad school uh, in political science. And then I ended up really liking being an academic and gradually made my way into uh, international relations and to some extent historical sociology. And that's how I ended up uh, where I am. I mean, I, I mean, I suppose my main home is IR theory in a way, but uh, in order to um, theorize better, I found myself <laughs> inching more and more towards history and historical sociology looking for um, examples outside of, you know, the current um, conjuncture so that I could, you know, theorize and generalize better and come up with better concepts that don't come with, you know, particular uh, presentist baggage. Uh, and that's how I kind of ended up at the intersection of, you know, history, uh, historical sociology and IR. Um, but I mean, I, I, IR is still my main home because what I'm interested in is coming up with better um, theories and better ways to think about, you know, how the world works. Well, I mean, um, so when I mean when we're theorizing, we're abstracting from what we know, uh, and what we know is, you know, the, the world that we live in. Which you know, uh, which is made up of territorial states, uh, uh, you know, that have you know clear borders. Uh, nationalism is present. You know, governments look a particular way. So, if that's all you know, you may assume that's you know how it's always been. And if you generalize based on that, um, I mean, you'll get somewhere. You you will be able to say something about this present moment. But then you may find if things change suddenly, um, you may find that the, the theories you've generated from those assumptions are no longer adequate. Uh, so it, the, to get away from the present as bias is, is to almost transcend you know, that <laughs> present moment and by using historical examples, um, trying to come up with uh, generalizations uh, or explanations that can also uh, help us make sense of a changing landscape, uh, a system that's in transition, uh, a future where, you know, for instance, nation states may not be the dominant actors. Um, basically trying to come up with, are there certain um, transhistorical dynamics about how, you know, politics work and how you know, the world works that, that can help guide us uh, as we move into uh, uncertain terrain. That's what I'm interested in. So, I mean, sometimes what happens, this is something I think about a lot. I mean, one mistake uh, that's very easy to fall prey to, and I think, you know, um, I wouldn't uh, exclude myself from that, is to take certain categories that work now and try to understand history uh, through that perspective. Uh, or, for instance, we know uh, 19th century empires relatively well, so there's a temptation to think about all empires and all of history to <laughs> to be uh, working along those dynamics. So when you go into history, if your goal is to generalize and learn from it, there has to be kind of a <laughs> back and forth conversation where uh, you have to, in, in some ways, you can't help but operate with categories of the present. At the same time, you have to be open to, <laughs> to finding other things um, in history uh, that don't conform to those expectations. And from that conversation and back and forth, hopefully you come up with a better understanding or a more generalizable understanding of something like, for instance, maybe empire uh, or uh, authority or sovereignty. Um, yeah, so not imposing present day assumptions, but also not, uh, um, not 
just staying in history, you have to also come back to the present. So both, both has to happen if you're doing historical uh, IR, historical theoretical IR. Uh, that's, I mean, that's something that um, I've been working on in in, in the uh, in my current uh, project, uh, which um, I mentioned. It's it's about on decline, and one of the one of the things that was driving me in that project was IR uh, in, in general has been very focused on great power decline, because IR is a state centric uh, uh, <laughs> field. Um, in the ways that we've discussed, which is important, of course, great power decline is a very, very important uh, subject. Uh, but I thought that uh, in our focus on great power decline, we were missing other levels of analysis and other types of decline that could occur. Um, I mean, lately we've, been, we've become interested in international order decline, but it's it's a recent development. Um, or in the book, I talk about you know systemic or structural level decline, which I put one level above uh, order decline. Um, and part of that was because our historical vision was relatively narrow because we started the history of the international uh, in 17th century Westphalia. It's, you know, there, there isn't even order decline in that history. It's, uh, there's transition from one order to another version of that order, but there isn't really uh, decline of orders and structural decline is just not there in the way that we understand it. But if you broaden the historical perspective and bring in, you know, for instance, Eurasian or, or Asian history, as I'm as, as I'm trying to do in the book, uh, all of those things now then come on the table, and then you can compare, you know, different levels uh, of of decline. So that would be one example. But there are many things like that when you uh, broaden your temporal or spatial vision, you suddenly see all sorts of things that fall out of the picture if you're only focused in you know 20th century uh, Western politics. So in I'm sure you will discuss this with your students. Uh, it's also your area of expertise, but uh, in international relations, uh, the terms order and structure <laughs> are often used interchangeably. And I think there wasn't you know, that much deliberate thinking about it uh, for a good part of the, uh, part of the, uh, the discipline. Uh, in recent years, we've become more aware that maybe these terms should be defined more carefully. Um, what, what I'm going to give you is my own definition that I'm operating with in this book, uh, where I've separated for my purposes, order uh, from structure. So the way I define it in this book, which is called Before Defeat, uh, are I, I put at the level of order institutions, uh, man-made stuff that are more uh, consciously uh, reproduced. Um, the, there is design. So if, if, if I can uh, echo back to my work on hierarchies, uh, the more you know, narrow institutional hierarchies would be for me uh, an example of uh, order, international order. So, well, of course, you know, there's the there's the caveat that even things that are designed often function in ways that that uh, they're not designed to function. So they kind of get away from their designers uh, at some point. But uh, there is more agency for me in in creation and maintenance of order. At the level of structure, I put things that are beyond the control of um, deliberate agency, um, which could also be patterns, but not not by not by design. Uh, so a lot of material stuff uh, would be um, would be at the level of structure for me, at least in the way that I'm understanding it in this book. But also certain deep norms uh, that have been around for a long time that people come to see as natural and and almost uh, universal would for me also be at the level of a structure. So uh, I give in the book the example of you know um, West, what 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 may be called you know West norms of Westphalian sovereignty um, the the, uh, the Western-centric social hierarchy of the modern international order for me 
these things are at the level of, of, of structure. Uh, that doesn't mean they're going to be around forever. They could also decline. I mean, that's what, that's what I'm, uh, or replaced, but they are beyond, you know, the, uh, control of any particular uh, agent. Does that does that help? I mean, that's that's how I'm thinking about it. I'm also making the argument that what's uh, order and what structure is not, you know, um, transhistorical. So, so certain things that used to be structural are now <laughs> part of uh, design and order. Like we are compared to our historical counterparts, we have much better control of. Um, for example, demographics uh, that, you know, that, that would be in a different historical period that that would be at the level of <laughs> demographic pressures, maybe at the level of structure purely. Now they're, they are moving maybe more towards, I mean, not entirely. So I say that it's kind of what's de determining what's structure and what's order is kind of like an empirical, <laughs> I mean, in addition to being a kind of an analytical question, but it also depends on the, the time period uh, you're looking at and needs to be kind of determined uh, based on based on that. For for within the confines of this book, I found it useful <laughs> to do kind of a level of analysis, like different levels of uh, decline. So for me, it was useful to separate these out. Uh, if I step out of the book, I, I may actually you know agree with what you say that there's there is. I mean, I can see the point the point that you're making um so yeah i mean i was actually trying to at the level of structure I, again we're kind of getting away from your recording i mean but i'm so like in the book uh i i was trying to talk about i mean i've resurrected this word uh ecumene you know from toynbee like because i want to talk about essentially like western decline and compared to Eastern decline. <laughs> and I don't want to call it civilization or, but it's not order either. You know, it's something that's transcends like the institutions <laughs> of, uh, so that's why I went to the level of kind of structure and I, I mean, I, you know, ecumenical decline. Um, uh, so that's basically where I'm coming from. I mean, of course, I still haven't submitted the book, uh, but so I'm open to, you know, <laughs> I'm open to being challenged on this. But I mean, I say in the book, like what used to be called structure in IR for me in this book, according to this definition is actually order. I mean, so, um, yeah. And I, mean, I remember like in grad school, uh, like we never talked about order. It was all like system structure. Like I don't, I, and then like in the, for the last five to 10 years, every, every, workshop I go to it's like order 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 it's like yeah so it's become I don't know I mean somebody should write a kind of a paper on tracing the <laughs> the the fate of these terms and their prevalence in, in discussions but I think I you're right yeah there by absence yes so what, what I'm I mean so the, the book has two parts uh, in the first part, I, I, I mean, the main goal is to get at these questions of decline and the levels of analysis. Uh, but the, main, the first part of the book, it's not like a typical IR book in the sense that the empirical content comes before uh, the, the theoretical discussion. In the first part of the book, I ask the question of what would, how would we write the history of Asia if, <laughs> if it didn't end in the way it did, which is with the you know the rise of the West and uh, uh, Western uh, domination, uh, which which I date uh, to nineteenth century. So um, yeah, so, so basically, I, I in the first part of the book I reconstruct uh, the history of Asia. One of my complaints about the I mean, it's, there's been a, this great push in IR to get away from Eurocentric histories, which has been really welcome, but it's a bit piecemeal. So in my mind, it was always like a question, like I kind of knew like what was happening in the Ottoman Empire in like 17th century, but I had I didn't quite know what was happening in, for instance, China or, you know, so I wanted to put all of those um, uh, polities on the same temporal plane and relate them to each other without relating them to Europe. And I want to do this also for, you know, students in IR. So they, you know, they could, uh, you know, <laughs> they could have a more comprehensive sense of the world. Uh, so, so the orders that I'm actually interested in are not the typical, you know, 
uh, European than Western orders. But I start with what I call uh, the Mongolian order. Um, and there's been you know, some interest in that in IR as well, but not from really uh, an order making perspective. Um, so 13th uh, uh, to 14th centuries, basically Mongolian empire uh, unites uh, most of Asia and disseminates all these, I mean, a lot of goods and you know, materials, but also a lot of like norms about how to organize uh, politics, not just to regions that they control, but also regions that they interact with. Uh, so that's the first order that I'm interested in. And then there is a second order that comes out of that in the same way, you know, the modern international order comes out of the uh, regional European uh, order, which I call uh, like post-Mongolian or orders. Actually, it's not just one order. It's more like interlocking uh, regional orders. Um, but there are a lot of, you know, um, legacy states that are still operating with some of some some norms that are, that they've inherited uh, to varying extents. So, for instance, you, you know, you worked on on the Ming. Uh, they display more of this in the beginning and then kind of get away from it. But uh, in the core of uh, Eurasia, in Western Asia, you have the uh, the Ottoman, the the Safavid and the Mughal empires that are kind of the great powers of that system, but they are also into interacting with uh, Europe, especially the Ottomans, the, uh, with the Habsburg and so on. So I understand that to be um, a particular kind of order that's been overlooked in IR because IR is only looking at what's happening in Europe and not to the whole world. And of course, you know, uh, Moscovy to the north is also displaying some of that. So I have a chapter on that order. And then I argue in 17th century, all of this kind of, you know, fragmented because of, you know, the general crisis of the 17th century, which of which the Third Years' War is only a small part, but you have basically crises all over Eurasia, which fractures and fragments. Um, what, what was an emerging global order into back into their regional, uh, <laughs> except you know in the west western part, uh, and then from that you know uh, Westphalia and European hegemony is con uh, constituted, but later you know um, so not in the 17th century but much later. So that's that's kind of like an alternative history of orders uh, and structural decline uh, that I'm telling. Uh, in the book, and telling that story allows me to answer basically three big questions that I have about decline. One is the question of Eastern decline, because since my first book, I've been puzzled by this fact that uh, so much of the 19th century reaction in Asia to European excursion was so homogenous and the reactions were uh, relatively the same, like the feelings of inferiority and stigmatization. And it, that's kind of a, if you think about that kind of a puzzle, because the traditional IR story is that Asia is made whole by European colonialism. Before that, you know, they're, they're, nobody's really interacting with each other. I mean, that's kind of the story, of course. You know, if you know history, you know that's not true. But even if you read, for instance, a foundational text like Kennedy, he talks about, you know, Asian um, empires as power centers, but he doesn't call them great powers. It's as if they don't exist in any kind of system, as if they're, they're islands. So you get this impression, IR, that like there was no <laughs> there was no interaction before Europeans went around and like, you know, kind of uh, dominated everybody. So from if you take that as a um, starting point, it's kind of puzzling that Asia would be so, <laughs> so uniform in its uh, reaction to uh, European ascendance. So I, I make the argument that um, 17th century narratives about a decline and crisis that is common to all of uh, Asia kind of intersected with 19th century narratives of European superiority um, all over the continent. So they, you know, they, anyway, I can talk about this a lot, but uh, I'll leave it there. Um, and then also allows me to think about different levels of decline. So for me, 17th century general crisis is an example of uh, structural decline, 
that is not made by like any particular agent in the system. It's, it, it's not because, you know, Western states are so superior. Uh, it's, it's actually like by all accounts, it's a clim climate crisis, you know. I mean, there are other explanations for it, but it's actually beyond the control of. Um, and when it's all said and done, you know, this uh, 50 year period, some, some actors are better poised to take advantage of, you know, the new conditions. And those actually <laughs> were more powerful before that, even though they are materially reconstituted, because we know, like, actually, like the Qing, you know, like a lot of the Asian states did expand in 18th century, but their ecumeny, you know, their <laughs> normative space had fragmented and there was no um, social coherence anymore uh, to that part of the world, unlike, unlike Europe. Um, and then, you know, I get at questions of, you know, Western decline, because I think the real comparison to what may be happening now with the West is, is what happened to, to Asia. It's not like, you know, China becoming a great power is not the end of Western hegemony. It's actually the loss of this belief that the West is the center of the world, which people thought about, you know, Asia, or especially particularly about, you know, um, East Asia, um, it was the place you had to like <laughs> control if you were, you know, to be great in that system. And that kind of went away for a while. This is super I did interesting. Have an episode I... Where I talk about all the, like the, you know, the civilizational people, you know, it, it, at, the, it, at the beginning of 20th century, it was very, yeah, this, this was a very, you know, uh, happening debate, you know, the civilizations have expiration dates and so on. So, I, I do enjoy that a little bit. I mean, I, I, in a way, I mean, you're right to pick up on it. It's kind of what I'm trying to do, but also like in a, in a way that's not deterministic <laughs> and also like doesn't make um, essential assumptions about, which is why I didn't want to use the term civilization and I'm trying to go with ecumeny instead. But if you have other suggestions, I mean, it's just like, a, yeah, I mean, a pr privileging of a certain kind of, social hierarchy i suppose as as like you know as deeply embedded in the uh, in the in the international uh order or international politics is kind of what i'm trying to get at i mean if you look at 18th century if you get out of you know the traditional ir history you know traditional ir history says there are these great powers in europe <laughs> in 18th century but if you measure like objectively, like based on what we know, actually like European powers in 18th century are not global great powers because materially many of the, um, the Asian states, even those who've uh, you know, been through the 17th century crisis are uh, just as wealthy. Uh, I mean, like Iran, well, it, it's not called Iran, but you know, they, the uh, Nasser Shah, he basically conquers like half of Asia in 18th century. Like, no, like he's, he's as big as Napoleon. Like we don't, we don't talk, I mean, before, before Napoleon, but uh, all of that has been kind of uh, forgotten. And, and, and maybe rightly so, because it's, you know, it's material power is there, but it's no longer the, the, the social pull is no longer in that region. It's actually like the, it has shifted. I mean, that's that's a certain kind of decline that I think we have ignored in the discipline and we've left it only, you know, and we, if we don't talk about it, uh, I, I make the point, like then we leave this ground to like um, white supremacists and so on. They're like the only ones who are talking about this stuff. Like, so we have to find a better way of talking about it while acknowledging that th this sort of shift does happen um but not in quite the way like like racists understand right uh, we have to you know i i'm trying to save that discussion i'm also i am i mean if asia is rising i don't want the history of asia to be dominated by like sinocentrism or turkeycentrism or whatever like you know each of these i mean none of these historiographies are actually like great alternatives to Eurocentricism. Like we need, we need to tell like global stories, you know, of, that doesn't privilege any one particular nationalist narrative. Um, so like histories of regions and interactions rather than, you know, 
so in in my mind like replacing eurocentrism with its like um i mean I, of course i'm talking about asia but like asia is in some ways very pluralistic right it's not just one religion or one race or whatever so actually by talking about all of Asia, you kind of get away from it in a way that is hard to do maybe if you're just only talking about Europe. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Of course, I mean, it's just one book, but, you know, I'm trying to do my part in, <laughs> in you know, fighting these trends. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say, like, I wouldn't say it's wrong to focus on also what is happening uh, with particular actors. I mean, as agents that <laughs> exist in structure, we have to do what we can. But I think um, in, in a way, in IR, we, like, we emphasize agency so much. <laughs> uh, and studying all this long dress stuff uh, made me feel um, I mean, not great, but in a way, like you, there, there is a ceiling to what what can be done in a way. Like, uh, so um, if in in fact we are headed into seventeenth century crisis, uh, the twenty first century version, which I also think we are, and I, I have a you know grand proposal based on this. But uh, then there is, I mean, it it it's not going to matter. Uh, <laughs> who's president, you know? Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know. It's not a very good answer, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 what I'm trying to say is like, I don't uh, blame anybody for studying the agent side of things because that's all we can do. But at the same time, perhaps find some solace in, you know, um, knowing that it's kind of religion, you know, structure is beyond our control. Um, and, you know, if things don't work, it's because because of structure, in a way. Get that? I mean, I am writing this book. I mean, I, I am a structuralist in a way, in many ways. Like, I'm a bird's eye view person. But why do I write the book? Because, like, I hope that if one person will read it, we'll have a better understanding of like <laughs> the the scale of what's going on, and maybe they will make, as a result, slightly better decisions rather than you know, um, making stuff worse. Uh, so. Yeah, I mean, I, of, of course, uh, um, you know, you have to have some faith in agency as well. Otherwise, you, you know, why bother doing anything, really? Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, what I did was there were a lot of people doing really uh, excellent work on hi hierarchy. Um, I mean, in including uh, yourself. Uh, so, so what I did was, along with you know Janice, bring, bring this work together just to make the case that we should take the concept seriously in international relations. So, in some ways, others have done more substantive work in terms of you know defining and delineating the concept. Um, the reason why I want to do that, uh, I mean, my personal motivation was, I'm always looking for, for concepts because I'm interested in you know finding ways to theorize better and for me that um, that goes through historical comparisons i'm always looking for concepts that travel <laughs> well across time uh, and for me hierarchy is such a concept because it's it's very uh, i find it to be a very f f uh, foundational you know dynamic in human relations that that uh, occurs over and over again all types of societies um, so um, for instance like people think like race is a trans historical category but it isn't I mean in, it, it's in some ways like what we understand race is it's a it's very modern you know it, it, it belongs to a particular uh, time and place it has its own you know history but if you uh, talk about you know hierarchies between groups that's for me a, a slightly more abstract and uh, more generalizable um, also in terms of how political authority is organized uh, both across units and also uh, also within units i think hierarchy is much more um, um, yeah it's more you can compare different types of hierarchies 
so that's where I was getting at, uh, where, where I was coming from. Um, in IR, there's because you know we talked in the beginning about pre present biases because IR is a discipline that came out of age in the 20th century and uh, was observing a world of you know nation states mostly um, and because those nation states are in um, theory uh, are supposed to be you know equally sovereign it seemed <laughs> that the world was not uh, you know uh, was not characterized by hierarchy but even if even if you take that you know starting picture of IR and scratch the surface, then you find all sorts of international hierarchies that still exist, economic and social and so on. So um, so that's why like, I, I think hierarchy helps us understand modern politics better, but it also helps us uh, make uh, comparisons across you know, time and space better. And the result is you know, uh, better understanding of uh, world politics in general. I think that's that's where I'm coming from. Now I'm working on centralization as a, as a similar type of concept that travels centralization and decentralization. I have I have a definition which <laughs> now that you ask I, I, I have to look up my own definition, but it's it's basically Jack's definition, the system of uh, sub and superordination. I mean, you know, right. I mean, that's the definition that we went with. Um, yeah, so any kind of ranked ordering, I suppose, would be. Uh, I, now I'm having like these flashbacks to like all the workshops that we, that we had, like what's hierarchy and uh, yeah, does it always imply this and that. Um, so I mean, I, I'm not I'm not working on it directly at the moment, but it's still informing a lot of my thinking and what I'm doing. And when I first started writing on stigmatization, there there was almost nobody who worked on it. Now it's you know grown. I get a lot of stuff to review. Uh, but one of the problems that I have, and that's what I'll talk about, maybe in, uh, it will be helpful to the students, um, as it, it became a kind of an accepted concept uh, in international relations, or at least certain corners of international relations, it migrated into um, kind of a, like a diluted version of itself. Uh, so a lot of people understand stigmatization like I criticize you, therefore I have stigmatized you, or like I discriminate against you, therefore I've stigmatized you. Like as an external act, one actor does to another. Whereas for me, and also I think Goffman, like if you go back and read Goffman, where I, I got the concept, what was important about stigmatization is that there was an internalization uh, on part of the actor that's on the receiving end of the stigma. Uh, of of the validity of that stigma, and it's there. It's therefore not an external thing one actor does to another, but actually something that is learned, so that you are socialized into. There has to be certain common norms and social understandings, and you kind of like absorb them without being able to kind of even help it. And even if you're not happy, like um, you know, Goffman talks about particular. Uh, uh, physical attributes, you know, that are stigmatized in society, uh, you know, uh, at least when he's writing in the 60s, you know, being blind and so on. So, um, and, you know, you, you may think you shouldn't be stigmatized, but you can't help but feel uh, that you, you know, you're deviating from normal expectations. So that's kind of what I was uh, I was trying to use that concept to think about, you know, this East-West dynamic that we talked about previously, because what you see in 19th century onwards um, is elites in the non-Western world, you know, they are, uh, they're not only like saying, oh, Western military technology is better than ours, which is something anybody can say, but they are starting to feel civilizationally inferior because you know <laughs> western tech i mean it's something that kind of permeates other aspects of life and it's not like oh we should materially catch up with them but there's something um like um 
wrong with us or we are like less than i mean and it is an internalization of that worldview like that i mean i guess it also overlaps with you know gramscian notions and so on but uh so going back to the if we relate it back to what we were discussing earlier like western decline and so on like right now we look at you know western actors look at asia and say oh like taiwan handled this pandemic better or you know um uh hong kong or whatever but uh there's almost like a kind of a denial about it, right? Like there's much more talk about like <laughs> New Zealand uh, and almost, I mean, almost little to very little comparison about like Asian countries. So the, obviously, you know, that, that that shows to me that there is still like in, in almost everybody's mind, West is kind of still the center of the world. Uh, and Asian countries could say to the Westerners, you know, you're doing it badly but nobody is kind of like internalizing like if if that kind of feeling of something is not right got bigger and bigger and then suddenly you know uh there was an inter internalization of the idea that the asian way of doing things is so much better and somehow there is something wrong with western civilization that needs to be like that that's the kind of thing that happened to asia in like 19th century and other parts of the world and that's kind of what i was getting at in the first book by using this concept of uh, stigmatization. Um, and of course, I mean, there are reasons to why that happens. One, and, you know, that's where uh, Norbert Elias comes in, you know, like this idea of uh, established and outsiders, groupness, and you know, so on. But long discussion, <laughs> if students are interested, they can read my first book along with other excellent work in IR on stigma. I think it, I mean, I think it's actually like doing a lot of, um, a lot of work that <laughs> and getting no credit for it. I mean, that's, I've, I've written about it. It's like, you know, there, there's this norms literature and, you know, for a long time, it was about like actors persuading other actors, like about how these rules or norms are like very rational and very beneficial and so on. Uh, and, you know, I have argued and others have argued like what's, the reason why like some actors start doing <laughs> something is not because they like are really persuaded that this thing is like really beneficial and helpful but because uh they they don't want to be stigmatized right they don't want to be left out it's kind of like this you know almost like a high school dynamic right in international politics you know you you if you're not sitting at the cool kids table like you are uncomfortable <laughs> and you have less uh, access to various goods, social and material. So, and then if somebody from the cool kids table, like the, you know, uh, comes and says like, you should wear your hair this way. It's not like uh, you are persuaded that's like the best way to do things, but you just want to be uh, in the inner club rather than <laughs> on the outs, right? So, so that's a basic, social dynamic uh, in human relations that also applies to states and i think ir like was ignoring that aspect of how things work uh, for <laughs> for a long time if you're like me from a country like turkey then it's like it's very obvious that this is how like this is i'm not saying it's everything but it's a good chunk of like what motivates people that you know was that, that we didn't really have a good explanation for and we were giving credit, <laughs> um, I mean, for the, for the causal work, you know, that stigmatization, dynamics of stigmatization uh, we're doing, we were crediting like rational persuasion. And I just don't think the world works, works like that. <laughs> <laughs>